possible options, or maybe the consent you might exercise from something like Rawls' original position. It's consent in those conditions that might justify differences in authority, even in a just society. Okay, now, this all matters because Nielsen is very concerned in ways that Rawls and Nozick often don't seem to be with ensuring that whatever our favorite principles of justice, people can actually abide by or realize them. Okay, so as Nielsen puts it, a liberty that cannot be exercised is of no value. If I have a right to vote, but am never allowed to vote, I certainly do not have much of a right. Now, I think this passage, the bolded one here, is very important. Like, if you ever get confused on rereading the Nielsen, if you ever get conf confused by some point he makes, return to this bolded passage. And then think about how the point you're confused about relates to it, and I think that'll clarify what you're up to. This is a very important point for, um, for Nielsen, right? It's like the difference between formal liberty and substantive liberty. Uh, and, okay, so again, the kind of the upshot of all this discussion is that if we're serious about principles like one, or even principles like Rawls's principle A, priority of liberty, then according to Nielsen, we have to be very wary about the formation, duration, and structure of hierarchies or of any differences in authority since those differences can keep us from actually exercising our relevant liberties. Okay. All right, so that's a long discussion of uh, Nielsen's first principle, but I think hopefully it's, it has some important stuff in it. Having said all that, right, Nielsen's first principle is very similar to Rawls' first principle. Nielsen's second principle, however, is quite different from Rawls' difference principle. Right? As Nielsen himself says, the sharp differences between Rawls and myself come over our second principle of justice. Now, these differences are important, and they're what we'll talk about for most of the rest of today. But before we look at how Nielsen justifies his second principle, I want to look at how he understands it, so we know what he means. All right. So let's talk about this first section, this underlined and, and, and redded section first. All right, this section says that uh, after provisions are made for common social or community values, for capital overhead to preserve the society's productive capacity. All right, so what does he mean by this con social values, capital overhead, blah, blah, blah? Well, he said the idea of this first section is that a share of the social product, that is, the stuff that we as a society produce, that, as he puts it later, at the common stock of means has to be put to genuinely social uses if we're going to persist as a functioning society at all. Right, so for example, some of society's money should be spent on roads and hospitals and parks and so on, which are what he calls common social or community values, while other funds should be devoted to doing stuff like keeping our factories and farms and water supplies in good shape, thus ensuring that we can continue to produce lots of stuff in the future, right? So that's what he calls capital overhead. So we got to make sure that we can kind of uh, keep society going, right? That's kind of the, one of the first things we have to make sure we spend our kind of social social product or common stock of means on. All right, so gonna imagine that we kind of spend that money first, right? Think about it like that. All right, so block that off. Uh, now let's move on to the second section of Noza, or sorry, Nielsen's second principle. The other thing we kind of uh, have to block off before we get to the distribution of goods to individuals is we need to make what he calls allowances for differing unmanipulated needs and preferences. Okay, so uh, as Nielsen understands his second principle, it does not say that all wealth, for example, should be divided equally, like equally dividing up a pie. Now, that should strike you as kind of a strange claim for an egalitarian like Nielsen to make. Right now, what does he mean? Well, okay, so we've just saw in the previous slide that we need to use some of the money, right, some of the social product to provide social goods, to save for the future, to preserve our productive capacity, and so on. So once that stuff is taken care of, should we divide the rest of the social product equally among all people? No. Okay, this is very important. As Nielsen points out, different people have different needs. 
and it's meeting people's needs that's the most important aspect of our kind of uh, theory of justice or, or, or how a just how just institutions would operate. Right? It's a very simple example of the kind of thing that Nielsen has in mind. Right? Someone with asthma is going to need inhalers right, to help them breathe. Whereas not, people without asthma have no need for uh, asthma whatsoever. Right? Other examples go back to the Singer cases. Right? Like, Men are not going to need access to abortion services, or people with you know people without uteruses are not going to need access to abortion services, whereas people with, uter uh, with uteruses might. Okay, so different people have different needs. So how do we take that into account in a rational way, given our desire to kind of achieve these um, egalitarian outcomes? Well, uh, what? So taking a step back from that, even. Um, a big question is that we should ask is then what are our needs, right? So uh, even in this second in, in this this part of the passage that's highlighted here, there's a distinction between needs and kind of mere preferences, uh, where needs are going kind to of end up being more more important. Uh, but what are what count as needs? Well. Nielsen doesn't give us a fully worked out answer to that question, but the basic idea is that kind of, uh, we need things like, you know, clean air, clean water, shelter, food, all that stuff, right? The things we need to stay alive and stay healthy. Now, uh, what counts as healthy is going to be a very contra controversial concept that we're going to need to work through more than Nielsen does here in a real um if we're really going to put in something like this into practice. Uh, but one important point that Nielsen makes here that I think is very interesting is that uh, our needs are not just necessarily the same thing as what we think of as our needs. So here's what he says. He says, the needs referred to in his second principle are needs people would acknowledge if they were aware, if they were fully aware of the various hidden persuaders operating on them. Right, so uh, it says that some of the things that we think we need, we don't really need, and we only think we do need them because of, for example, advertising. Now, I take it that that's actually a pretty easily acceptable point for all of us. Right, have you ever realized that something that you thought you needed you didn't really need, and you only thought you did because of advertising. I think in my own case, I, I, I know there are examples, right? especially from when I was a little kid. Right? When I was a kid, like, I, I, I knew that I needed this toy or that video game or whatever. Right? But no, I don't, I don't really need those things. They just uh, was convinced by peer pressure or advertising or whatever that I needed them. So what Nielsen wants to say is like, look, uh, what count as needs for the purposes of satisfying principle two are not just anything we really, really want, but things that we would still want even if we were aware of how we came to want the things in the first place. Right? And a lot of things we would not want were we aware of how we came to want the things in the first place. Right? If it's just because of advertising, we probably would not still want the relevant things. So this is one distinct, helpful part of the distinction between needs and preferences that Nielsen makes, and needs the most important thing, right? Now, as he points out, mere preferences, right? Like, you know, I suppose I like mystery novels, whereas you like romance novels, right? Those are differences in our preferences, not our needs. He says that mere preferences should be roughly equally satisfied too, but meeting everyone's needs has priority, which makes it. All right, now we're going to come back to our discussion of meeting needs in just a second. But before that, I want to talk about this third section of the second principle first. And it'll be clear why in a minute. All right, so after we right, do all that social spending stuff, and then we make sure that we're uh, only paying attention or specific, mostly paying attention to the unmanipulated needs and preferences of people, the idea is that the common stock of means is to be so divided that each person will have a right to an equal share. All right, this is the most obviously egalitarian portion of Nielsen's second principle. Right? But again, 
as Nielsen understands his second principle, it does not say that all wealth should be divided equally, like equally dividing up a pie. So an important, the po important point here is that uh, as he puts it at the, in this last section of principle two, it's only that we have a right to an equal share, not that we all just get an equal share of the common stock of meat. Right? Now, saying that we all have a right to an equal share does not mean that we all actually get identical piles of stuff. Right? And that's not just because we have different needs, it's also because we have different preferences. Right? So he gives some examples. He says, I have, or rather should have, an equal right to have fish pudding, gross, or a share in the world's stock of bubblegum. Ceteris paribus, that means all things being equal, I have an equal right to as much of either as anyone else. But not wanting or liking either, I will not demand my equal share. Right, so the idea is that we have this is a big stock of fish pudding, big stock of bubblegum. Everybody, as Nielsen imagines in a just society, has an equal right to kind of equal share of fish pudding or bubblegum as anybody else. But look, uh, not all people are going to claim the equal share to which they have a right. Right? Nielsen personally is not going to uh, exercise his right to a share of fish pudding, or he's not going to exercise his right to a share of bubblegum. Right? So uh, we're not all going to end up getting the same identical piles of stuff, but rather we, we all have a right to an equal share of the common stock of means, that is, the social product. Okay. So that's the idea. Right? You don't all get the same stuff. You have a right to an equal share, which might be expressed in different ways. Right? So if you imagine that, like, even in a kind of Nielsenian egalitarian society, we're like, imagine we all get a universal income, right? Maybe that's how we divide the common stock of means equally. Uh, maybe we all get identical amounts of money. Well, a little bit different because different needs will be more expensive or less expensive to meet. But putting that complication aside, suppose we all get the same amount of money, then the idea is that like, we can go to the, the grocery store and get what we want and not just all get potatoes, right? Some people like, might like potatoes, some people like, might prefer rice, and so on. So we can live kind of different lives with different stuff, even if the, the third section of the second principle is realized. Or at least that's the idea. Right, so uh, now kind of segueing back to our discussion of needs. Now, Nielsen says that when needs are at issue, something stronger should be said. If I need a blood transfusion, I have ceteris paribus an equal right to blood as anyone else, but I must actually need it before I have a right to an equal share or indeed to any blood plasma at all. Right, so preferences and needs here are treated